his daughter, Leslie, who is a writer. Um, and so what you're going to see today is sort of a snippet version of what will be revealed in full in the book. Um, so look for that this summer. I think Earl Silbert is one of the people whose perspective we really haven't heard in many public ways yet. Um, and so this, I, I think, adds a lot to our understanding, particularly of the pressure that was going on with the investigation in 1972 and 1973. So without further ado, I am going to um, I'm going to introduce you to remarks that Earl Silbert made earlier this week, and we have edited them into about a 25 minute video um, that we'd like for you to watch. And then Earl and Angelo and Dan Mahan will join us live and we'll continue the discussion and then we'll have time for questions and answers afterwards. So thank you for being here. And I'm going to um, turn off my video and turn this over to Shane to start the video of Earl Silbert. All right, as you see, we uh, don't have any sound. So um, I am hoping that Shane can hear me right now um, and I will just kind of fill in while we uh, try to figure this out. Um, so what you're going to see in this video is um, Earl Silbert talking about his experience um, from the time that he's alerted to the burglary, the fact that it's happening, um, to the pressures that he felt leading up to uh, the trial. And then also, you know, the kind of critical part um, that was really interesting to me as I was inter interviewing him was the fact that um, this is ultimately taken away from him and, and given over to the special prosecutor, um, Archibald Cox. And so to you know, work so long and so tirelessly on this only to have it taken away is really kind of quite astounding. All right, so I am going to stop my video and we're gonna hope for the best. Okay, so Melissa, um, I'm gonna play it again. Um, so can we hear that okay? I'm just gonna play it again. We can hear you. you can hear me, can you my hear me? My name is Earl Silbert. And at the time of Watergate in You can hear it now, Melissa? Yes. We can okay, hear. good. Sorry, I, I muted myself and that muted the video, unfortunately. So, okay, sorry about that to the audience. Here we go again. Seventy-two. I was working as the first assistant United States attorney in the District of Columbia. The early morning hours, six thirty in the morning on uh, Saturday, June seventeenth. I, I believe I got a phone call, and the phone call was from one of my colleagues, uh, who said, "We have a hot one here." Five persons arrested in the Democratic National uh, Committee offices located in the Watergate building. The following Monday, the United States Attorney, Mr. Titus, said he was going to assign me to that case, whatever it was. And what they had were five persons arrested, four of them Cuban, 
Uh, by Monday, we knew that one of them was a security consultant for the Committee for Re-Election of the uh, President and had been a, uh, a security consultant in the CIA. So already things were beginning to uh, percolate, not in any direction we knew, but other than it was uh, going to be a hot case. The only thing open was how hot was hot going to be. There are different attitudes as to how the relationship between the FBI and the U.S. attorneys were prosecuted. The FBI, there's, there's some that say the FBI investigates and arrests. The U.S. attorneys try the case in court. That's not my, uh, my philosophy, my attitude. My attitude is that they work together. They're kind of almost like a seamless web and they coordinate. They have their differing responsibilities. They have their differing they have their almost authorization. But at the top of the list, it always has to be the coordinated effort working uh, together. I was very fortunate as the person assigned to lead this investigation to have the opportunity to work in the benefit with the work of uh, the agent team. They were outstanding. I did not know uh, Angie until the Watergate uh, case surfaced and I met him right away as a case agent. Um, a couple of uh, colleagues in my colleagues in my office, the US attorney's office, told me that he was a good agent and uh, they were right. I mean, he was a ball of fire and uh, you know, in, in, in you know, he was assertive, but not in any way overly aggressive. But he was, you know, he just went at an assignment. He went at it, uh, you know, uh, aggressively, but responsibly, professionally, and he got the job done. Flashing blue eyes, swift of foot, Dan Mahan, special agent. That's how he introduced himself to me. <laughs> And that, as you can see, I have not forgotten Lo, these many years. He and Angie were a terrific team uh, together. They assembled a group of uh, four other agents, uh, special agents, and together they worked uh, with Seymour Don and myself. And they were, in, in my view, a terrific group to work for in a case that just had one headache after another. That was, of course, the phrase that the press officer for the White House used as saying the president's not going to get involved spending time on a third rate burglary. Well, that could mean, you know, a number of things. Either that it, the, what they were looking into was burglarizing wasn't very important, as well as a burglary that was done with lack of apparent lack of uh, professional skill. And uh, it, it was in the report in the newspapers that, you know, those who specialized in burglaries of the like, well, the equipment they were using was outdated in high school nature. You don't bring up people from uh, Miami or Cuba to conduct uh, a burglary into a offices of a Democratic National Committee headquarters. So there were a whole host of criticism. And that was important in a way because you know, the FBI and, and the police uh, initially, and certainly the U.S. Attorney's Office and the grand jury, were struggling to determine whether they could figure out whether there were others involved, so-called higher up, that had ordered or authorized this, uh, you know, bur bur burglary and break-in, or whether this was something that these eight, these uh, six, seven people were performing or uh, acting or uh, taking action on their own. Of the four, four Cubans, all but one had CIA, some kind of CIA uh, background. You know, it looks suspicious. As the investigation progressed, we didn't see supporting evidence. And we were starting to get ready for the, the following indictment, we get ready for trial. Seymour came into my office one day and said, you know, 
we got a very strong case against these guys. They don't have any real defense that we know about when they go to trial. They may well choose to try and lay it off of the CIA. It's kind of the CIA is a mysterious organization that people don't understand or uh, you know, know a whole lot about. And they operate in unusual, mysterious ways. Uh, maybe you could you know, uh, cloud things up as a defense attorney for your client and, 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 and create a reasonable doubt as to whether or not these guys were really CIA or, or whether they were, you know, just out for, the, for their own political and other purposes. It made a lot of sense to me. And uh, I think that day I called up and spoke to a deputy general counsel in the CIA. And we had it back and forth for several months and were developing some information not that indicated that the CIA was in, involved in the sense of participating, authorizing, supporting, initiating, anything like that. But it looked like they had, uh, for one reason or another, provided some material, uh, some disguised material uh, to Hunt and Liddy for some surreptitious activities that they were in the process of pursuing as members of what the White House called its SIU, Special Investigating Unit. And uh, they engaged in other criminal activities, which became very important to our investigation. It became clear, actually, by early to mid-September, that there was no way the case was going to be tried before the election. Defendants do have rights. They have right to investigate. They have right to interview witnesses. They have the right to seek evidence favorable to themselves. So you can't just force them to go to trial one week after indictment. So it was clear that, that we just couldn't make that goal. There was too much that we had to do on our investigation because under the strategy that we were pursuing, I, did, I wanted the case we brought against the seven to be as tight as could be in order to obtain conviction and convictions that would be bullet, bulletproof on appeal. But as a prosecutor, you are always worried. And it's not only that you're concerned that they might acquit, although of course that's acquittal, but you're also concerned that one or more jurors, and it only takes one, might hold out and not vote for conviction. And the result of that is that the best you could then do is to retry the case. And that was something that was totally unattractive in this case and would have frankly been a disaster for the government and, 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 and the prosecution. That was a case from the prosecutor's point of view, you had to win. You couldn't lose and a loss or a mistrial one juror holding out would be considered a loss, created on the prosecution. You want to do it right. But the concern was that if this defense came in relating to you know, higher ups, that jurors might feel improperly that the defendants were not the real culprits in this case, but were being used as scapegoats. And they might then decide, might you know, exercise their the rights that they have as jurors not to convict, and that that would jeopardize our authority because then that would deprive us of the strategy that we thought was appropriate to try and convict them and then compel them to provide information that they knew. Time is marching along, election day is approaching. It was bothering me that we would not know the facts of Watergate. Were there higher ups? Were there not higher ups? We didn't know. Some evidence is suggested yes, other evidence suggested no. And we were met with the wall of silence by all the defendants who weren't talking. So I was wondering if they thought to myself, is there a way or something we can do to try and uh, move things along faster than they ordinarily would. There are regulations that the government has that you're not, prosecutor is not to make decisions as to how to handle a criminal case based on politics. 
politics are not to be included in the decision making process. That's a fair provision. But I wonder if there's something I can do to at least try and get someone of the seven to decide best interest to cooperate with the government and tell what he, he knows, whether it's people higher up, yes, higher up, no, either way. The best, most likely thing I could do, limited, would be to offer one of them a, a kind of a lenient plea agreement of the kind that I would never offer if we were you know, adversaries throughout. And uh, see if that would induce them to come forward and give us the benefit of, their, of what they had to say. My conclusion was that the person that you would first look to would have been Liddy because he was the top of what we had. But as I said, he wasn't talking to anybody. Next on the list was McCord. I had just noticed in, in court, in about McCord, that made him look to me very unhappy with where he was. I said, why don't we, why don't we come up with an attractive offer to McCord? His lawyers were in town October 25th. I asked to meet them with him. I would offer him one count pleading to a conspiracy where he couldn't, you know, under the indictment, he was up to over 25 or 35 years. So I was reducing the indictment, the potential maximum, to five years, with credit for cooperation and the like, if he would cooperate. I got a call the next day saying from his lawyers, he's not interested. I was angry uh, because prior to the election, in October, the last week of October, was when after back and forth in my own mind as to whether I could do this or what I could do, whether it was appropriate and not inappropriate. I had made the decision to try and uh, induce him, persuade him to, uh, to come forward and tell us what he knew. I didn't know what he knew, but to tell us what he knew. Uh, and to do that, at least prior to the election, so that not a whole lot of time, but that it would be some time that one way or another, that question might be explored so that voters would be, you know, know what they're voting about when they went to, went to the polls and exercised their right to vote. I got a prompt rejection. I mean, it wasn't as though he waited three weeks and then decided. I mean, I got an answer from his lawyers virtually the next day after we had sat down and I explained my thinking to them and proposition to them and, and the offer of what I thought was a generous plea agreement. He didn't come forward then. He doesn't come forward until two days before he is to be sentenced. And he has every reason to expect and anticipate mm. that the judge is going to impose heavy sentences, not only on you know Mr. Liddy, clearly, but also on him as 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 well. And and in my view, he was, you know, seizing this opportunity to try and influence, impact, have a significant effect on the sentence that uh, would be imposed on him at the last minute before the opportunity for citizens to exercise their right to vote had been um, you know, provided. The court was doing what we wanted because we wanted someone to feel they had, should come forward to cooperate. We wanted to be the ones that initiated the process, although under the the letter from McCord, we would be doing the same because Judge Sirica would refer to us to handle in the grand jury. Without intending to do so, I don't think McCord really helped our effort to try and see if we could break the logjam and determine whether or not the higher ups were involved. So, in that sense, the letter was helpful, though I don't think it was intended to be helpful in that regard. It was intended to be helpful to McCord, and it succeeded. You know, when the FBI conduct interviews, they create a form known as a 302, which is a little statement of interview. You know, we didn't have the kind of equipment, technological equipment that we have now. And communication within the bureau was largely by teletype. There was word that came out, you know, kind of leaking the Washington community that the FBI 302, the statements of interviews were somehow being uh, located, seen uh, in areas other than 
confined within the offices of the U.S. Attorney's Office for Grand Jury and the FBI. The FBI kept hearing reports of this, the agents did, and that was you know, troublesome to them because it was interfering with their investigation, but no one really knew where they were coming from. In February of 1973, the trials are over, the pleas are over, not sentencing, I think, and it's still open. The court has not yet uh, writ written his uh, letter to the, court, to the court. I always went over to the department one, one afternoon to meet, uh, probably with Henry, or with Henry Peterson. I don't recall the precise purpose of the meeting. I do remember that when I came in, I heard Henry and the Peterson talking over the phone with someone, and he was discussing information that had come up from my questioning of Magruder and the grand jury within the past week. He was the person to whom Liddy would have reported and, and uh, in the chain of command that they had, it would be Liddy, Magruder, and then John Mitchell as the chair. Magruder had appeared before the grand jury, I would question him, who was in that position of uh, being, you know, exposed and having contact with Liddy. And I heard uh, Henry Peterson say that it was a very close case on the Magruder as to whether he should be charged. I thought he must have been talking to Dean. I'm not sure why I thought that, but at the end of the day, I was like, I recall, I think he should arrived back to my office, which was about five blocks away. And he said, uh, I said to him, well, who was that on the phone? And I said, you talked to him on the John Dean. I said, you think that's a wise thing to do? He said, yes, I do. But you have to have some people you trust. And I think John Dean is an honest man. He and Henry Houston have a close relationship. When I did I think it was the right thing to do, I didn't. But and I made a point when I was at science in the case that I would talk to nobody in the White House, and that was absolutely for investigative purposes. Henry was a law enforcement person. And if he had any said, you know, reasonable inkling that Dean was actually acting to obstruct and interfere with, disrupt the functions of, of the government and the Department of Justice, the White House, the FBI, he, he would have been, in my, in my view, just totally intolerant of that. After the trial, we subpoenaed Liddy under an order of use immunity to testify. Liddy said nothing. That was nothing new. Liddy never, never said anything of substance to us. But then after he was in the grand jury for about an hour, we adjourned or met in an adjoining witness room. There were a bunch of reporters, you know, who were wanting to uh, you know, find out what happened. They, they could see us go into the witness room with, with Liddy and stay there at least for, about for an hour. He had come to court with a big black eye uh, on, on his face. You know, we asked him, uh, well, how did you get that? He said, well, I was in the jail. I got into some form of dispute with a, another inmate over a comb. Uh, we were going to duke it out, and he sucker punched me and hit me right in the eye and knocked me down before I could get ready. Uh, I, I got up, he told us, and, uh, you know, went after him. You know, he was bigger than I, but I showed him and others that there was no Kool-Aid in my veins. So, you know, you just hear somebody uh, give that kind of account, you know, you try not to react too much, but it does make an impression. And then he also had on his, one of his wrists, a, a bandage. Well, Mr. Liddy, what's, what's that bandage for? He said, well, I'll show you. So he unwrapped the, the bandage and displayed a festering sore that was just ugly to look at. Well, how did, how did, how did that happen, Mr. Lee? He said, well, I self-inflicted it. Well, what did you do that for? Well, he said, I wanted to prove to myself that when Sirica, the Judge Sirica came to sentence me, and he was getting ready to impose the sentence, that I would be able to withstand any pain that he wanted to inflict on me and I knew he would want to inflict pain on me. And so I 
got a cigarette lighter and I exposed myself on my wrist and I also put a cigarette lighter burns on, on parts of my body and I could prove, and I did prove to myself that I could withstand whatever he would try to uh, inflict on me. So the reporters were sitting on, on just on the floor, you know, leaning against the wall because there were no chairs for them that particular day. And there were a number of them. And um, they waited during the entire time that uh, Liddy uh, was in. We were just talking with uh, Liddy. And uh, when we came out, as, as always, they say, you know, well, what did you talk about, Mr. Silver? What did, what, what did you discuss? And, you know, consistent with what my general practice was, I never responded to those inquiries, maybe a smile or something of that nature, but nothing more uh, than that, and certainly no substantive answer as to a subject of discussion, which I would, you know, never have uh, revealed. Four Cubans that uh, pled guilty, McCord and uh, Liddy are, are convicted by the jury found guilty by the jury. People are awaiting sentence, and we're pursuant to a strategy that we had developed based on a recently enacted statute in 1970, Organized Crime Control Act, which permitted something called use immunity, which is a potential very important tool for the investigation of criminal conduct, particularly organized uh, criminal conduct. The importance of that was that it permitted the government, if it deemed information that somebody had valuable and that, that person was asserting his Fifth Amendment rights not to have to incriminate themselves, not to have to testify, the government can go into court, file a motion, and ask the judge to compel the witness to answer the questions put forth by the government, but with the recognition that what the witness says will not be used against him. That was very important to persuading, among others, John Dean to come in and start the secret negotiation with us. He indicated in the course of our discussion, early on in the discussion, when we were meeting with him and his lawyers, that uh, he, one of the things he had seen uh, either in the newspaper or from other discussions uh, in, in, in the news media, that Liddy had been seen talking with the prosecutors down at the courthouse, and that made him nervous that Liddy, who of course knew basically everything, would start to talk or uh, was perhaps uh, thinking of working out some kind of arrangement uh, with the prosecutors, and that made him very nervous for his own self-interest as well as those uh, of the presidency. John, he and his boy, was a very good boy, uh, had put to us, we'll talk with you, but you are not to pass on what we say to you to either your boss, Harold Titus, the U.S. Attorney, Harold uh, Henry Peterson, charged in the criminal division, and the overall supervisor of the case, and the attorney general himself was declined. He said, we won't talk to you otherwise. And I had initially reservations because the idea of a career public servant at the time, not telling your boss uh, important, critical information, that you know struck me initially as a troublesome you know, question. And uh, but see what they had gone to their credit were uh, very firm, you know, we we should do that. We should accept the agreement uh, of secrecy and non-disclosure. And that uh, the fact of the matter is we don't really have any choice because we cannot say no to receiving potential information that, you know, based on the suggestions that have been made to us would disclose a uh, obstruction of justice conspiracy of unimaginable proportion. So I was finally persuaded and came uh, John Dean uh, dropped to us one Sunday afternoon. You ought to look into the Ellsberg case. Uh, the Ellsberg case was a was a prosecution for Ellsberg for leaking the uh, Pentagon papers. 
and the trial was ongoing at this very time. It was going on in California. And Dean, through his with his lawyer, dropped that dime, or as they say, or you know, say, this is something you may want to look into. Turned out that they had been breaking into the office of the Ellsbury Psychiatry by Hunt, Liddy, and uh, some of the Cuban uh, from uh, Miami. That was very significant. It was a process that we were going through. And part of it was dictated by the nature of the presentation that Dean and his lawyer were making to us. In some respects, quite frustrating because he was so general in what he had to say, so vague in what he had to say. The difference we drew was that this wasn't being made up. It, it was hard to see where we were going to go because it was non-specific enough in criminal cases. If you're thinking of a case of a prosecution, you have to have specificity. You have to have particular facts. And that was something we weren't perceiving with Dean's comments as to who was responsible as between her and Haldeman, Dean himself, and John Mitchell. There were changes there. And so it was somewhat of a moving target. So we were, we were moving with the moving target and trying to keep abreast of it, and at the same time, obviously maintain the integrity of the information we were receiving. Peterson's reaction when we told him uh, and his colleagues what the recent developments which was news to them. Peterson's first reaction, he wanted to know as we were saying, well, we've come across this conspiracy of drug justice. Was Mr. Mitchell involved? That was, a, that was a, a, on his mind. Was Mr. Mitchell involved? And someone said, you know, someone said, yes, he was. And Henry just punched his hand right into a, you know, piece of furniture or something like that with a, I and mean, that really, uh, you know, upset him. Simon, other than the burglary case, you know, that brings in a person by the name of Mr. Gray. There have been suggestions that somehow we should, we, that is I particularly, should have more closely, you know, investigated Segretti. There are innumerable responses to that as to why that that just makes absolutely no sense. Uh, I suppose the most compelling argument is that U.S. attorneys do not generally prosecute election campaign election violations. Those are handled in the Department of Justice. And I did talk to Segretti. I concluded based on the conversation, and I think that's not been challenged, that he was not involved or related to the burglary case that I was in charge of investigating through the you know, federal grand jury. I called Peterson that very day after I had talked to Segretti, and I said, I've talked to this fellow. He, he doesn't have anything to do with the burglary. What he describes what he was doing it was disgusting. It was repulsive, but I can't see a criminal violation. But I'm not an expert in this federal campaign election law, uh, to which Peterson said, well, neither am I. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to the person in the, in, in the criminal division and I'm, that handles those cases. Shortly thereafter, I got a communication from that attorney saying, can you give me a file or this or that, whatever information you have. So he's looking into it. Now, to me, that's the end of the uh, the matter in terms of what to do with the gray. If, when I was assigned to investigate the Watergate burglary, you know, uh, that was June. The election was coming up in November. And so the idea was initially to try and focus 100% or 190%, 200% on trying to get ready. Now, that turned out not to be feasible uh, based on what we had to do to get done, but that was working solely and exclusively on the burglar, on the burglary and bugging case, which had plenty uh, of issues that came up uh, from start to finish that uh, took our time and, and more. Watergate is going to serve as a key event for so many aspects of 
honesty in government, dedicated public service, honesty, integrity. In assessing what Watergate was, it's important they know what the underlying facts were. And if they look into the underlying facts, it's that the system worked. There were hiccups. There were criticisms. But that's always true in, in you know, when you have a controversial public service event. There are different views, different attitudes, different opinions. And it's important that the public be fully informed as to what was going into the mix. You still there, Melissa? I am, and we're on. <clears throat> All right, well, um, as everybody is kind of joining us, we are having some technical difficulties uh, with Damahan. So we're gonna have him on audio um, and he is going to hopefully respond through my phone. Um, we'll see how this goes. We're giving it our best. Um, so I would like to ask, um, if you're on here, um, Mr. Lano, could you turn on your camera? And actually, Dan, we have we have you on here as well. So um, if you can turn your camera on, I think that would actually be great. We might be able to hear you. Um, so we'll see what happens. What happens there? Um, all right. Well, Mr. Silbert, it's a pleasure to have you here. My pleasure. And, um, I, I, I've got to tell you, I've waited a very long time to hear your story. And so hearing it for the first time this past week was, um, it was really exciting. And it gave me a really kind of different perspective into Watergate. Um, so we're thrilled that you could be here and we look forward to um, what you have to tell us about. All right, so I would like to get started and um, the first question that I'd like to ask is uh, this one. 50 years after the break-in, um, we know now that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the best burglary that had ever been carried out. Um, in fact, they've been called the Keystone Cops, um, the gang that couldn't shoot straight, can you tell us, Mr. Silbert, some indications that you encountered from the very beginning um, that showed that the burglars maybe lacked the expertise that you would normally expect for a burglary of this sort? The burglars, uh, in preparation uh, for their uh, attempted burglary on the night of uh, June 16th, had uh, working for them. Come on, Melissa. <laughs> a fellow by the name of uh, Al Baldwin. He was to serve as the lookout while the five burglars, Miss Jim uh, McCord and four uh, Cubans, uh, entered the Democratic National Committee headquarters at uh, 2600. Virginia Avenue uh, to uh, burglarize and uh, wiretap the premises. They went on to the, uh, they got onto the property. Baldwin, meanwhile, was back in a Howard, uh, Mo Howard Johnson Motor Lodge across the street. And he was in a position uh, uh, from which he could see into the Democratic Mass Committee headquarters. And uh, he was, uh, to keep looking and alert the burglars if uh, there was any reason that uh, they should be notified of law enforcement persons in the vicinity or anything of that nature. The time passed, uh, the burglars were late in getting started. They were working on their uh, defective uh, equipment, uh, uh, defective wiretapping devices. And they went, um, uh, they, uh, Albert Baldwin kind of got bored. So he turned on the TV and he got uh, Friday night, Friday night at the movies, he got absorbed in the program and he didn't continue to keep looking outside uh, the windows. Uh, but the next time he did, he saw an unmarked car of the police drive up and with plain clothes types uh, carrying, uh, you know, with weapons. 
and he tried to notify without much of uh, that success, the, the, uh, the burglars inside the Democratic National Committee headquarters, but it was too late. The police were on the scene and the five uh, burglars, McCord and the four Cubans were arrested <laughs> on the spot with guns drawn. Great, thank you for that, Mr. Silbert. Um, Angelo, you had your own perspective at the very beginning. I mean, you were there um, almost right after the burglary took place. What is it that you recall about the hotel room that day and, and what you saw when you walked in um, to the Watergate Hotel? When uh, Peter Paul, my assistant or my, my associate, when we arrived at the uh, uh, second district headquarters, uh, we, we did meet with uh, Chuck Work, uh, the, one of the detectives was working on an affidavit. Um, I asked if we could speak with the uh, individuals who were in custody. Uh, we went back and, and all five uh, refused to answer any questions until they had an opportunity to speak to their lawyer. Uh, I then asked if we could examine the uh, uh, material that was uh, in their custody at the time of their arrest. I went through uh, what I would call a gym bag, an AWOL bag, and it was just loaded with uh, 35 or 40 uh, canisters of film to uh, Madolta cameras. But at the bottom of the uh, bag uh, was uh, something that caught my attention. Uh, uh, as I pulled it out, it was turns out that it was a uh, small black device wrapped in tissue paper reach back into the bag and here comes a second one, reach back in the bag and here comes a third one. Um, I had prior knowledge of uh, devices used uh, in uh, intercepting communications. Uh, I felt it was a listening device. Uh, I called the uh, supervisor back at uh, the field office and he recommended that uh, we take the device that was found along with uh, uh, another um, piece of equipment that was located in a, uh, uh, what would you call it, fire alarm box, uh, which is mounted on the wall. And there was a device, something hanging out from, from that, wires, but at the back of it, but at the end of it uh, was a small miniature microphone. So uh, Pete took all the devices back to the uh, FBI lab. They immediately described them as interception devices that are used for intercepting uh, telephone or oral co uh, conversations. Uh, we uh, we uh, uh, immediately upon hearing that, we told uh, uh, AUSA Chuck Work, uh, I believe they added that information to the affidavit. Uh, once the affidavit drawn up by the police department uh, was authorized by a judge, uh, we accompanied the uh, police department, police officers over to the Watergate Hotel. Um, two of the individuals who were arrested had keys to two different apartments in the hotel. Uh, I, along with uh, two other agents and uh, a couple of detectives went to room 214. And when, we, when the door was immediately opened, uh, the curtains, the windows to the balcony were open and the curtains just fluttered. But immediately looking into the room, the bed was just covered with, um, as it turns out, identification papers, airline tickets, $100 bills, uh, wallets, uh, and an attache case. Uh, in the attache case, which belonged, which was identi identified as being property of uh, one of the uh, arrested, Gonzalez, uh, was material uh, dating back to 1965, like, you know, didn't know what that was about. Uh, but anyway, two of the other eight, two of the agents that accompanied the search, uh, went through the dresser drawers of the, of the, of the hotel room. Uh, they located this, uh, envelope with a check, uh, the return address on the envelope was E. Howard Hunt, I believe, uh, living in Potomac, Maryland, if I recall correctly. And uh, inside the envelope was a check made out to some country club. Um, a few minutes later, one of the agents announced that, hey, we found all this money. 
and it was, uh, I believe, $3,400 in uh, sequential $100 bills. Um, and some of those numbers corresponded, serial numbers corresponded with $100 bills that were on the bed. Um, so um, I think after the search, the room, the room was photographed by the police department. Uh, and, and the uh, odd thing about it during the entire search of while we're recording serial numbers and identification, assisting the police department, uh, I noticed that there was this individual standing in the doorway next to one of the detectives. And I asked uh, uh, Detective Smith, Art Smith, uh, who is the gentleman with uh, uh, Sergeant Donnell? And he says, oh, that's that's uh, Washington Post reporter, Al Lewis. And he says he, he accompanies he accompanies us on all these major cases. Yeah. Yeah, at the, at the time, we didn't, know, we didn't know it was a major case. That the that the, the news was there from the very beginning. I find that fascinating. Um, Dan, can you hear us? I can hear you loud and clear. All right. Can you guys hear Dan? I yes. hear you guys. Lost audio. Hey, Earl. Okay, I think I think Melissa is just getting down on the on the line, and then she'll be back. So if we just be patient for a moment. Here we go. Right, I'm back. So we have had um, some pretty significant technical difficulties, which I apologize for. Um, and actually, the individual trying to call in earlier was was none other than Dan Mahan. So we've got him on audio, and I'm hoping that we can hear his perspective as well. So we were talking about the leaks, and um, Mr. Silbert, Mr. Lano, both of you dealt pretty significantly with leaks throughout your investigation. Um, can you tell us about that? Earl? Well, go ahead, Ann. Um, the, the leaks that were occurring, uh, as best as I recall, were appearing in the, in the press or on TV uh, probably about, say, 10 days, two weeks, sometimes three weeks after we had already concluded that alleged uh, uh, leaked information, we had already solved the issue. Um, it was it was disturbing. You know, we, we looked at each other like, you know, where's it coming from? Uh, having worked uh, criminal matters for the previous six years, um, I know what the relationship is between uh, Earl's office, the grand jury, and uh, the people that, that that work with me. All 27 guys knew that if we got information from the grand jury, uh, Rule 6E uh, precluded us from discussing it outside uh, the investigative uh, authority. In other words, we, we didn't tell people who, we're, who we were uh, interviewing uh, that, you know, your name's gonna appear in the paper next week. It, it disturbed us. Uh, we could not figure out how it happened. It wasn't until uh, Mr. Gray was being, uh, Nom or had been nominated to become the uh, full-time director of the FBI. And on uh, February 23rd of 73, uh, he called a meeting at his office of which I was one of the attendees. And at that meeting, he announced that uh, in the first week uh, of the investigation, he had been uh, contacted by, by John Dean and asked for uh, information about the investigation. Uh, Gray says he stalled for a few days on responding to Dean. However, the following week, uh, Dean, had, Dean had alerted him that the president had appointed Dean to be the full-time White House investigator uh, in the Watergate matter. And consequently, hearing that I, Pat Gray, released to uh, John Dean all the FBI 302s and reports and teletypes that had been uh, created in, in those first couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I was just astounded, I couldn't believe it. I, re, I recall standing up and saying, 
now I understand why we weren't getting the full story during our interviews. Uh, these people had to be uh, prepared for our questions. Uh, I immediately left that, let that meeting, ran down to Earl and told him that, you know, what had happened. Of course, right now, at, at that point in February, I think it was shortly after uh, McCord's letter to, to the court. So Earl had his investigation going. We were following uh, Earl's leads and uh, just to be uh, astounded that this was going on behind our back. And I remember in earlier conversations that we've had, you said that was the lowest point of Watergate for you. It, it was for me because I know that uh, we had 55 field offices around the country. Ed Leary recently told me he had, he had done a compilation of everybody involved and he came up with 500 and I believe it was 572 agents that worked this case uh, not only with Earl, but later when we were appointed to go work for the uh, special prosecutor's office. So that's a, a hell of a lot of people straining uh, to accomplish what, what the government, what the Department of Justice was asking us to do. And yeah. I, it, it was just gut-wrenching that uh, we were just blindsided. Yeah. Mr. Silbert, what, what, remem what memories do you have about the effect that leaks had on on the trial and preparation for the trial? Uh, well, so the, um, just as uh, Angie uh, indicated, the, uh, the, the existence of leaks can really undermine the ability of, of the victim of the leaks to conduct uh, their, uh, their investigation and do so in a manner that just as, as a battalion, uh, a battalion commander on the field can be extraordinarily, you know, totally helped and assisted if if he or she knows uh, the location of their uh, uh, opposing armies. Mm -hmm. It's the same here in in, in, a, in a criminal case to give those under investigation who may have reason to obfuscate and conceal what's going on in the investigation for them to get what it is that the government knows, what the FBI knows, what the police know, what the US Attorney's Office knows and the grand jury, that undermines the integrity of the investigation and the ability to do the job. So leaks are very serious uh, to the government in uh, prosecution, police, FBI, and carrying out uh, their responsibilities. Absolutely. Um, I, Melissa, what? can I can I just add one more thing? Uh, in that first week, uh, I believe it was the, the following Saturday, uh, the 27 agents that were working that week when the investigation began, we were called back, we were called into uh, acting director Gray's office, and uh, we were literally reamed out over, over leaks, and we just couldn't figure out what he was talking about, and this had to do with something from uh, a reporter named Sandy Smith. Uh, subsequently, as, as time goes on, um, I was asked uh, on four different occasions to, to uh, either participate in or conduct the interview of uh, Mark Felt. And it, some of it had to do with, with uh, leaks in a different matter, uh, missing documents. Uh, however, it was really ironic to go back and look at the FBI headquarters file and it's just interesting that at the end of each interview, uh, he plainly stated, uh, regardless of what the press has to say about me, I'm not deep throat, I never leaked anything, and so on. So. Yeah, and I, what, what I took away from a lot of our conversations that we've had about your time in the Bureau is that, especially in those early weeks, Mark Felt is kind of, playing it both ways. He's trying to figure out, does he want to really champion the FBI's investigation or does he want to get in the way of the investigation? Um, was that sort of what you saw? I didn't see any champion going on. I just yeah. just plainly saw our investigations showing up in, on the television or, or in the newspaper. And, and it was just heart-wrenching to see that these guys are working as hard as they can. Information's uh, coming in uh, every hour from around the field 
Er Earl knew that because more than once he and Seymour commented, can't believe you got the results this quick on the information that we requested, only to see it show up in, in a, a form of uh, a press statement some you know weeks down the road. Right. If, and, if I think uh, if I could interject something here, please. Um, you have to remember. I remember doing some of the interviews at the White House, and we were specifically told uh, from our headquarters that if uh, we would conduct any interviews at the White House, they had to be in the presence of Dean. Right. Uh, and that was a requirement to interview anybody at the White House. Yeah. I also remember that. Uh, I have my own opinions about, well, you know, why Felt did what he did. You have to remember, Don Gray was appointed direct director, acting director, and then director. He wanted to be director of the FBI so bad um, that he would do anything to get support from the White House. Mm -hmm. I think, in fact, one of the reasons that Felt became deep that throat. He wanted to be director or he wanted someone in the FBI to be director and not have a, an outside, an outsider brought in. That's just my, my take on it. Mr. Silbert, I, I, I'd love to hear your perspective on this because, you know, you were working as a U.S. attorney when a lot of change was happening at the FBI. I mean, Hoover has died six weeks before Watergate. L. Patrick Gray is in, you know, there are all these leaks coming out. What were your thoughts on the FBI at that time? Or were you so focused on the trial that you weren't really, you know, focused on that? There was so much going on, Melissa, that I actually, uh, as best I could, focused on the investigation moving forward and trying to get ready for the trial. A leak in this, leaks occurred. They were very harmful for the reasons I just indicated and Angie and Dan uh, have mentioned. But at the same time, you got to go forward and deal. the leaks have occurred. You got to deal with what you have and do the best uh, that the best that you can. And uh, in addition to that, my experience had been that leaks are hard to investigate. It's hard to find out who leaks and you can spend a lot of time uh, you know, that's not very productive, and particularly when we had uh, in the water gaze a very short time uh, limitation uh, that was imposed that we felt under to try and do the most thorough investigation in, in, in the shortest possible time. Well, those two are mutually exclusive. You can't do both. <laughs> and we tried, you know, uh, as best we could, but that was a, a continuing uh, problem and uh, important uh, is important to recognize as part of the problems uh, that we were meeting. Um, going back to uh, uh, what uh, uh, Angie uh, and Dan were talking about in terms of the disclosures, I remember talking with uh, Henry Peterson uh, sometime in the uh, the Watergate case has broken open in the sense that the investigation is ongoing. And uh, Mr. Peterson told me that he had spoken to uh, Gray and Gray had said that John Dean had asked him for the FBI uh, 302s and the like. Mm -hmm. And um, Peterson said, I told him to uh, put it in writing. Have, that is that he, uh, Gray, should have John Dean put it in writing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I kind of put it out of my mind as, as something. And then, of course, I learned as the, uh, the Joaquin was getting uh, the th 302s when I, when I learned that. And it, it must have and I don't know whether for, to this day, actually, whether Henry Peterson was, was aware that notwithstanding his advice, because he never got anything in writing from Gray. And, and he didn't know that the 302s were, as far as I know, being uh, disclosed. Wow. Wow. So one of the things that I, I'd love to hear more about from you, Mr. Silbert, um, there was some tension, as I understand it, between the strategy that you were pursuing at trial versus the strategy that you felt Judge Sirica at times was pursuing. It, it sounds as if maybe you had different objectives 
Can you tell us more about that? Uh, I don't think uh, that we had different perspectives. Uh, we wanted to, you know, investigate the case to as far as it would go. Uh, if there were higher ups, we wanted to find them as desperately as anybody else wanted to, and, and likely uh, more, more so. Mm -hmm. uh, and Judge Sirica, Chief Judge Sirica was a stern, serious, responsible, strong sense of right and wrong uh, judge. And he wanted to do what he thought was in the interest of justice. Mm -hmm. And his view as it began to become clear to Don Seymour and myself was that that the or that it was important at the trial itself there were seven people that had been indicted by the grand jury let me just back up so a little context uh, at the five that were arrested plus the the hunt whose name was mentioned as having a check at, at the uh, and was a part-time White House and employee and Gordon G. Gordon Liddy, who was a general counsel for the committee to reelect the president, President Nixon. So they had been indicted by uh, our investigation. And uh, the, the, uh, it, it, as the trial progressed, it became clear to us that Judge Sirica was looking for the trial as a vehicle of disclosing who the higher ups were. What's the evidence about who, who gave the orders, what the motive was, whose responsibility it was, who profited, who didn't, uh, and, and, and the like. And that was uh, troublesome to us in the, for, this, for this reason. One, we thought that if that became, the more dominant that became in the courtroom, a defendant might be, you know, uh, uh, McCord and Liddy, who had gone to trial, might have a basis for appeal, and that the judge was injecting into the into the case issues that had nothing to do with their guilt or innocence, and could only operate to their uh, dis, uh, disadvantage. Uh, we had run into what we called, referred to as a wall of silence. All seven persons that uh, had been indicted by the grand jury uh, were uh, pleading and uh, their Fifth Amendment right not to be compelled to be a witness against themselves, self, privilege against self-incrimination, it's, it's sometimes called. Mm -hmm. And uh, that none of them would talk. And uh, so we were kind of running up against that wall and uh, we wanted to, you know, we came up with a strategy to get around that. And that is relying on the, uh, recently enacted statute that provided prosecutors uh, and the government with a, what they called use immunity and ability to compel a witness to testify and overcome their Fifth Amendment rights by providing certain protections to the witness under those circumstances. Mm -hmm. And that was our strategy, but we had to get the conviction first because that was the procedure. You had to get your conviction first and then you'd go to the judge and ask for the motion to order the witness to compel if you laid out a basis for that. That was our strategy. But that meant we wanted to get, I, I drafted the indictment in that case, and I drafted a narrow indictment, a tight indictment, one that I hoped would, one, win conviction at trial without raising a lot of other issues, and two, on appeal, if there was a conviction and appeal, they would stand up on appeal and not be, in, not be uh, one that would be uh, turned, you know, turned over by the Court of Appeals. And that was what the, 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 the goal of the target that we were pursuing. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes as your question indicates, you know, was a different strategy. I think the strategy in the sense was different, but the goal was the same. Uh, Ted Zerika's heart was in the right place. He wanted to do the right thing. He wanted to protect the rights of the government and the public, but he also wanted to protect the rights of the uh, defendants before him. We, the prosecutors, were focused on our strategy to you know, convict those that we had evidence of and then go around uh, their wall of silence and come up with a method for obtaining uh, evidence from, the, uh, from, from them as to whether or not there were higher ups. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. Um, 
What do you think are the biggest misconceptions about the Watergate investigation today? What are some misconceptions that you've encountered over the years as, as you've told your stories and as you've listened to others? Oh, have you finished? I'm sorry, have you finished? <laughs> well, I, well, I uh, 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 we wanted, obviously, we were trying every which way to come up with a way to determine whether or not there were higher ups. During the course of the investigation, there were indications that we, you know, that there were higher ups. There were indications that there weren't. You heard some um, examples of Liddy's conduct. He was definitely yeah. a seven indicted, the boss, the chief, the money man, the one in the one in charge. Mm -hmm. And um, but on the other hand, uh, so th that was indicated that uh, maybe he, you know, the buck stopped with him and it didn't go higher. On the other, and also he and uh, Magruder, who was the, the deputy chief of the. Uh, uh, of the committee for re-election of the president, the deputy in charge, he and Liddy did not get along at all. And yet if the conspirators went above Liddy, it was logical that it would be Magruder. And there were some questions, well, could those two have really worked together on something like that? On the other hand, there were factors that indicated, hey, this, this clearly had to be something that the, uh, the, the uh, entity, the committee for re-election of the president was involved in. There must have been uh, higher ups. Uh, there was too much money floating around for it not to, to be financed by Liddy and his group. So, you know, but we didn't have evidence to establish that. We did not have an insider and, uh, you know, a, co a conspirator who was willing to participate, uh, um, tell us about his uh, participation in, in um, this, you know, the, the break in and, and, and the burglary. Mm -hmm. So that's why we developed uh, the strategy uh, that we that we did, Mr. Lano. I, I I'm, I'm sorry. What was what was the rest of your? I, I may not have completed. Did I complete the answer? Oh, you? you did. That that was actually a wonderful answer, um, and and I think that gives a lot of perspective. Um, Mr. Lano, I was going to ask you. I mean, you you've been kind of vocal over the years about. You know, there, there have been accu accusations that the fact that James McCord's house wasn't searched um, right away was evidence of a cover up or, you know, things like that that have come out over the years, theories that people have had. Um, wh what have your thoughts been on things like that? Well, uh, before I get to McCord, I want to go back to what Earl said about the CIA involvement um, on the... I believe it was the evening of June the 20th, uh, the Miami office had alerted me that they had gotten uh, information from Barker's bank account that these Mexican, four Mexican checks and one from uh, Ken Dahlberg had shown up in Barker's account. Um, I, we did get the, we did get the uh, subpoena, faxed it down there right away. And uh, I told, we told uh, Earl and Seymour about it and Don. And um, the, the idea being is that that evening, uh, my boss, uh, Bob Kunkel, had asked me what I thought was going on. And I may have been out of line, but I said, well, we have these four or five people, four associated with, with the CIA. And suddenly we have foreign money in Barker's bank account. Is it a CIA operation? So my thought at the time was, we've got to follow this money. Let's either prove that it's CIA money or it's not. And uh, consequently, with, with Earl's help, uh, we were able to trace uh, the, the money back to uh, a contributor uh, associated with a oil company down in Texas, uh, which, which led us to uh, uh, the uh, involvement of a, of a lawyer in Mexico City uh, who was able to get these checks and and we consequently showed that it was campaign campaign finance money not CIA money uh, and in that money uh, the the bank we had traced the serial numbers through 
three Federal Reserves, and we showed that there was, I believe, $50,000 in $100 bills that went to the same bank that uh, Barker did his business at. And one of the bank managers remembered that the day that the checks were all cashed, he had, he had it, the bank manager had included $10,000 of this money that had been received from the Federal Reserve. I believe it was the F series money. So we put that all together. Uh, Earl, Earl took it, uh, Earl and Seymour took it to the grand jury. Uh, Earl got the people who made the contribution uh, to work with the government. And I think we, we eliminated the CIA there. But later allegations about uh, uh, the FBI not conducting a search warrant on McCord's residence. Um, the rule that, that I remember to this day was you had the information had to be within 10 to 12 days, I believe, uh, before before a judge would approve it. If he didn't have anything, if, he had, if it came after that, uh, it's 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 not useful. Yeah. Um, if Baldwin, uh, when he was located, I think on the 20th of June in New Haven, if Baldwin had immediately said, hey, I was doing this, uh, I brought equipment to McCoy's house, uh, I think Earl would have uh, assisted us in drawing up an affidavit and getting a search warrant for McCord's residence. But we had nothing nothing current. It was, I think, July the 5th when uh, Baldwin actually uh, told Earl, uh, along with uh, Baldwin's lawyer, mm -hmm. of, of his involvement in monitoring and removing the equipment from, from Howard Johnson's. Right. I I'm gonna ask a question that the audience, um, we have a really good question from Joseph Candle, Campbell. Um, and I'm, I'm actually gonna tack my own question onto his because uh, Joseph, you get to a really good point. He writes candidly, why do you believe Woodward and Bernstein receive so much credit for uncovering or exposing the Watergate scandal when they were clearly and consistently behind federal investigators. Um, so why do they get credit when you know they're basically using your material to, to report? But let me also ask, um, Mr. Lano, you had an encounter with Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward and Mr. Silbert, you kind of got caught up in the middle of that. So if you wanna tell us that story as well, it's, it's a pretty good story. Angie, you wanna start? Uh, well, it, it, uh, Earl was having a hearing, uh, I think it was on a Friday. It was the, the, uh, discovery hearing with the uh, hunt when he was going through, uh, the evidence that you were going to use against him. It was, uh, material that was found in the safe. And then you just, he said, Hey, there are, there are things missing. Well, it was that evening. Uh, I had received, or, no, I'm sorry. It was a previous evening, uh, I had received a phone call around 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night from FBI headquarters saying that uh, there's a, Mr. Bernstein wants to talk to you immediately. And we weren't allowed to, to speak to the press. However, earlier, I believe it was earlier that month, uh, Mark Felt had uh, given me permission to talk to uh, Bernstein. And I said, you know, so we could determine who his source is. And I basically told FBI headquarters, no reporter's going to tell you who his source is. It's a waste of time. But anyway, uh, to get back to the phone call, Bernstein was, was uh, asking questions about some information that apparently Sloan had given to the grand jury, and it had to do with a certain amount of money. I was not privy to the conversation you guys had uh, with Sloan. I, I was out of town, I believe, that day. Uh, anyway, uh, the next morning, uh, Earl's having the uh, the uh, hearing with uh, uh, with before the judge with uh, Howard Hunt and his lawyer. Um, Woodward and Bernstein came walking out of some alcove between the uh, courts courtrooms, and uh, Woodward pulled out a piece of paper and he says, basically, I have a typewritten transcript of your of the conversation we had last night on the phone. And I said, well, if you had a conversation with me and you recorded it, you didn't have my permission. And I remember 
grabbing one of them, I don't remember which one, it might have been uh, Bernstein, and pulled them down to the courthouse, the courtroom, Judge Circus courtroom, and I'm kind of beating on the door trying to get somebody's attention. You guys had the hearing going on. Finally, a marshal uh, came out, answered the door, and I asked him to get Don. Uh, Don came out, separated me from the reporters, and uh, sent me up to your office, Earl. Um, and, and then you guys came out and had some kind of confrontation with the with the two uh, two reporters. Um, they were accusing me of of admitting that uh, Haldeman had this. Uh, I guess it was the slush fund, hush hush money, uh, secreted, and was using that to pay off uh, uh, the defendants, keep them silent. I didn't know anything about that, and I wasn't at that day. I was not privy to what you guys learned from uh, from Sloan, although you told me later in the day what it was. I just want to clarify. So um, Woodward, if I remember correctly, Woodward was going to claim that you had been the source, Mr. Lano. Yeah, they accused me of being a source of some of the, the information and also. Rebecca would have held you in contempt of court if if that had been true. So it was actually, it was a pretty serious moment for you. Mr. Silbert, what do you recall of that instance? As you can just see uh, by the, by uh, Angie's the recitation this afternoon, uh, he's still hot over it. So uh, <laughs> bear, that, bear that in mind. Um, actually that, that uh, day in the, in the evening, I got a call at home. Oh. And, um, it was uh, Bernstein on the phone. Oh, God. And um, he said, Earl, um, I'm calling you because I've got the story going to run tomorrow. And I have four sources, but I'm looking for a fifth. And you're the person with the greatest integrity and all of this that I can imagine I'm, I, I want to find. So I knew right away he was blowing smoke you know, right, right at me. and. Um, he said, um, you know, we have reason to believe that Haldeman's name came up in the grand jury with respect to this money. And, um, I, you know, I want to know, you know, what, what, what have you just got to say about it? I said, I don't have anything to say about it. That's grand jury information. And that's secret by law. I can't disclose it. I'm not going to disclose it. Well, we went back and forth and he kept trying to, you know, praise me, of, you know, uh, and, and the like, and finally he said, "Okay, I'll tell you what. If the information that I have is right, then just hang up on the phone." I'd never heard that request from a newsman, so I kind of stopped and thought, you know, hesitated, tried to you know think through what's he asking, you how how should I handle this? And the next thing I knew, he hung up the phone. So, you know, he was in a way by saying that, that uh, by hanging up, the information was right. Well, in fact, I knew it was wrong, but I didn't, you know, I hadn't said anything right one way or the other to him, other than, uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the incident fell apart the next day because uh, accusations were made that the, uh, that the paper had printed a, uh, or the, an incorrect uh, account of, of what had happened and the, the, the testimony that they claimed was mentioned in the grand jury wasn't there. You know, that was the newspaper's business. It wasn't mine. I wasn't involved with that other than I was in the court that day, as uh, uh, Angie uh, indicated, and who comes walking down the corridor but Carl Bernstein. And uh, we, you know, we come up to one another and, and Carl says to me, Earl, did I read you wrong last night? And I said to him, Carl, my conscience is clear. And, and that was the end of the, uh, that was the end of the conversation. That hearing, Earl, was uh, Hunt telling the court and you and Seymour that uh, there were items missing uh, from the safe. And it turned out to be the two Hermes notebooks. Well, that became an issue later on. Uh, yeah, that, uh, that that's another story by yeah. <laughs> uh, by by it, by itself. 
Um, but going back, uh, listen to a question you raised about wanting to try and breach the wall to uh, determine whether or not there were higher ups. Mm -hmm. It presented to me with one of the great, most difficult dilemmas I've ever c confronted because I was sitting in, you know, in my office worrying. This is in uh, October of 72. This, you know, the, the trial is not going to occur before the election. There's no way that's going to happen. We've got a stone wall. What are we going to do? And I, I thought, well, maybe what we ought to do is make a kind of a sweetheart deal with one of the McCord, Hunt, or, or Liddy. And um, that really, there's a regulation that says you shall not, got a, a Department of Justice regulation that prohibits you know, employees from making decisions that would be, uh, have an impact that will stay understood, might have an impact on a federal election. And um, what I thought was, uh, was weighing uh, and should we consider giving the sweetheart deal to an, in, uh, persuade uh, one of these burglars to come forward and tell us what he knew about the involvement of others with, with their uh, higher ups. Liddy I knew wouldn't talk because he never talked. And so I went to, I thought McCord, I had reasons to think he might. So uh, I, uh, I called up his lawyers. Uh, oh no, first of all, I told uh, what, I, I was troubled though, because I knew I would be violating that regulation if I made, uh, made an offer that I would not have made under any other circumstances than a, an important national election was pending. And I vacillated back and forth and uh, uh, finally said, you know, I just have to do this. I mean, we've got to do something. It's just not right that the public doesn't have a right to know. So I thought, well, we'll offer him a plea to a, a five-year felony, and you know that would be a starting proposi you know, proposition, which would be much less than we offered or would offer if there weren't such a circumstance uh, that that is the national election. Um, I told uh, I told my idea to, to uh, Don and Seymour. They agreed. I called Peterson, told him what I would wanted to do. He agreed readily, and uh, I spoke to his lawyers the day you had your confrontation with Carl. They were in the courthouse, said, this is what we'd like to do. The next day, turned down flat. They said, McCord just isn't going to buy into anything like that. That was very distressing, and uh, boy, I must say, I was, I was really uh, angry with McCord for refusing kind of deal and what the, you know, the time and attention and thought that went into trying to persuade him uh, to come forward and uh, let us know, uh, give us the benefit of whatever knowledge he had. Well, it, I, I think one of the things that has, has so struck me about your story, Mr. Silbert, is the fact that, you know, particularly in the beginning, you're running up against a presidential election <laughs> and you feel this moral obligation to get to the truth so that voters can make the best decision. I can't imagine the amount of stress that that was. Um, the Watergate uh, uh, case in which uh, Angie and Dan Mahan and Don and Seymour and others, many others participated, that was constant stress from the beginning. <laughs> Uh, to the end of our involvement. So it, 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 it started the first uh, day uh, and continued until, you know, we withdrew from the case. Um, I think, I think the, the, the toughest day, uh, Earl, was, uh, sad to say, the day that the, uh, the gang from the special prosecutor's office knocked on your door and basically saying, you know, you're no longer involved, it's us now. Uh, there, there's no words to explain the job that, that Earl, Don, and Seymour did. It was just super fantastic. Uh, when I, I didn't go to the special prosecutor's office, uh, I was ordered by the 
FBI headquarters to assist them. Um, I, I don't know, use the word stonewalled. Um, I laid back two, three or four days before somebody at, at headquarters had received a phone call and saying that the special prosecutor's office was looking for me and a couple other guys uh, to come and assist them. Uh, reluctantly, uh, I went, but always in the back of my mind, um, there were three guys. Um, I, I'm going to go ahead and ask a few more questions from the audience. Um, I'm still kind of sitting with that because it's, it's sad. It's sad that you guys worked yeah. so closely together. Um, and I, what, what struck me and I, I'm, I hope I'm not oversharing, but Mr. Lano, as long as I've known you, you always reference conversations with Mr. Silbert, like you guys still talk. Hey. Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, we, <laughs> he calls me or I call him whenever he's available. Um, the rapport that we had, I think for the first week, maybe even 10 days, Earl, Don, and or Earl and Seymour would come to the office and review the material that the, we were, the results of the leads that Earl had asked us to cover. They would show up in the morning, read it, and then go back to the office. And then subsequently it became uh, on a daily basis, after after I assembled our troops together to go out and cover leads, I'd pack up my stuff, go down and sit with Earl, Don, and Seymour, and tell them. Then I, then I would relay to them uh, the, the the results of, of the leads that they had asked for. Uh, it was a daily conversation, 365 days. Yeah. All right, we've got some good questions. I've got to get to these. Um, I, I think we've got about uh, about three questions. Um, and so hopefully we can get to all these. I know we're bumping up against our, our time limit. David Kaiser uh, said another one for Mr. Silbert. Didn't Hugh Sloan tell the grand jury that Magruder and or Mitchell approved large sums of money for and wasn't that good evidence that higher ups were involved? Well, certainly the uh approval and expenditure of large sums of money was a major factor in our consideration and investigation into whether or not we could prove that there were higher ups for which we could allege and charge specific criminal offenses. That's what you have to do in, you know, in the criminal pr uh, procedure so that a defendant is advised of the charges against them. You have to have facts. You have to have specifics. You have to have uh, particulars. We had, the, the, we had traced the money. It was about $250,000 uh, we, we were able to show had been authorized. The question is, one, what happened to the money? What was, this, what was it for? Who was involved? And the question was, who did we have? Was it a, a position to provide us with credible information about that? And we got, we, you know, we subpoenaed the people. We brought in the, them into Magruder three times into the grand jury, at least, uh, during that period of time, and a host of other uh, potential witnesses that might have some, some knowledge. John Mitchell testified, be, uh, testified uh, uh, before, the grand, before the grand jury. Marie Stans was, uh, was interviewed. So we, we tried everything, but we had the wall of silence uh, confronting us. And we had, whether it was through the leaks or otherwise, there were the witnesses were testifying. Some of them we felt were just plain out lying, lying to us. Others we felt were just not telling us what they knew. But you know, we don't believe in or use the rack and the screw. You know, you call the witnesses in, and you uh, you testify uh, that. Um, you know, they, uh, you, you do the best you can to find out what the facts are. For example, with respect to, you know, the, the money, Mr. Magruder was like the prime person going up the, the ladder, the conspiratorial ladder. He, he came up with an explanation as to what the, some of this money was for. A good deal of it had to do with convention security, mm -hmm. public and party. And, um, 
he um, he was a pretty good witness, I have to say. I mean, he he wasn't a star, but he was good. He he was convincing and articulate and, and made a nice appearance. Um, but he also had somebody testify that supported him, one of his assistants, who was very credible. And he, on key issues having to do with the expenditure of funds and the like, explained and supported the testimony of Magruder. We didn't have anything to counter that other than, well, it's just too much money, it doesn't feel right. You can't base, in my view, a prosecution uh, uh, based, you know, predicated on that kind of information. And you just have to have more. We didn't have more. That's why we adopted, you know, the strategy uh, that, uh, that, we, that we did. And in my opening statement to the jury, I said, you know, they got this money. We can't account for all of it. We don't know what happened to all of it. That was a very, I felt, unusual kind of concession to make uh, at the start of a trial uh, having to do with the, among other things, the abuse and use of you know, monies for illegal uh, purposes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that, that is unusual from a prosecution standpoint, for sure. All right, this is a question for uh, Mr. Silver, Mr. Lano, or, or Dan, and I think this is a good one. What are the remaining mysteries of Watergate for you? And does anyone want to speculate about the Spencer Oliver bug? Okay, um, hanging out there for me, uh, and I think uh, Earl and I just had a discussion within the past 24 hours about this. Um, the discovery of Hunt's check in the dresser drawer, the $3,400 cash, $100 banded money in another drawer. Um, looking at that money and Hunt's statement, I think in one of his books or before the Senate that he had left um, the Howard Johnson's, went to the White House, uh, left the suitcase of the some of the electronics gear in his safe and removed uh, ten or twelve thousand dollars that he had in there. Uh, it to, to me the, the you know it's one mystery uh, why his check uh, when when uh, Pete Paul and Don Stuckey uh, early early evening of that Saturday went to. Um, Hunt's house to interview him about the check. They had a copy of the Lakewood Country Club check. Uh, he said it was his, and that's about as far as the interview went. Uh, he wished to, to speak to his lawyer. Uh, the agents left and, and uh, basically that was it. Uh, his wife was not there. His wife was in Europe at the time. Uh, but the mystery just, to me, uh, that's just one, one thing that hangs, hangs out there. Mr. Silbert, any thoughts? Um, in terms of, uh, of mysteries, well, um, I would, uh, by the time, I should say this, by the time we, we got through, and I say the FBI and uh, Don Seymour and myself, so we, we thought we had a pretty good idea of, of uh, the facts. And uh, then, you know, um, as uh, Angie indicated, we, the special prosecutor came in. And by the way, I just, uh, I understand and appreciate uh, Angie's uh, uh, comments, but um, the, 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 special, the special prosecutor and his team, I thought, um, I didn't follow it that closely. Once we withdrew, I thought I should withdraw. withdraw. I thought they, they were good lawyers, they were talented lawyers, they were dedicated lawyers, and they did a good job. They were up against very good lawyers for the defendants, uh, and it was a, you know, a, a tough a legal battle. But I don't think the, uh, the goodwill of any of these persons uh, was, was open uh, to question. In terms of, 
you know, being, you know, having been succeed, succeeded by a special counsel, that was very difficult. It was very difficult, obviously, from Angie. You could tell that by what he said and how he said it. It was difficult for Seymour and Don and certainly for me. Uh, but, you know, that event had gone beyond the, the office of the U.S. attorney or particularly Don Seymour and me. It had taken on a matter of national significance, and the Congress took the lead in this and felt that they wanted to have a special independent prosecutor. That was a legitimate decision to make. It was very, you know, devastating to the three of us, but nevertheless, it was theirs to make and uh, not, and, and I uh, understood that as frustrating and disappointing uh, and devastating uh, uh, as, it, as it was. And uh, like I, said, I thought they did a, did a good job. Uh, the question of independent counsel, should you have one or should you not? Can the Department of Justice uh, handle it? That's a controversial issue. There are people that believe very strongly on either side. I am on the side that uh, I think the Department of Justice can do, can do the job. And uh, that challenge is being is, is, is on, on the table right now. And I, I think in good hands, very good hands. I am so sorry to say this because I want to sit here and just have you tell me stories for the next two hours, but we actually have our next panel in five minutes. So we've got to draw things to a close. Dan, I want to give you the chance to, um, is there anything that you want to say? Any reflections? Yeah, the only thing, I heard you, the last thing you were talking about is anything you would you like to have known. Apparently McCord was sending, uh, you want to call them progress reports to a CIA handler in McLean during this whole period of time. Mm -hmm. I would have liked to know how that came about, why it came about, and essentially what they were doing with it. Because I, I did the interviews over there and it wasn't much that came of it, but I was always curious about that. That's a great question. I think there are a lot of people in the audience that would love to know that as well. Mr. Silber, I'm gonna give you the last question and if you can just answer this quickly. Um, in your video, you say, you know, the great thing about Watergate is that the system worked. Would the system work today? Would it work under other circumstances outside of Nixon? Well, I think we've got a challenge in front of us right now. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, starting I think tonight at uh, eight o'clock on, on, on TV when the, the committee starts to present its matter. It's got a very serious, important uh, problem confronting it and uh, it's got uh, some very issue difficult challenging complicated controversial issues that are confronting how it's going to operate when faced with very severe and troublesome uh, charges mm -hmm. I, i'm hoping that the uh, what happened in the case uh, in the watergate case and the dedicated work that was done in that case by the, those persons will carry over, and I'm, I'm confident that it will. As I said, I think the department is in good hands, and I hope that the uh, uh, the challenges in that case and the present case, just by reading the newspapers, appear to be tremendous and very, very difficult. And uh, but it'll take uh, parties of goodwill working together to work their way through. On that very um, insightful and uh, thought-provoking answer, uh, we'll wrap things up today. Uh, Dan Mahan, Angela Olano, Earl Silbert, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for choosing to share your story. We're honored to have you share what you did. Um, and uh, we thank you for your time and wish you well. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye. Mm -hmm.